What kind of world is this? A sustainable, just and peaceful world. And the marketplace is democratic if we only choose to make it such. What kind of world is this? Welcome, friends, to episode four, Social Business and New Capitalism. We now see Americans increasingly rebelling against the endless predictable crises promoted by the established left and right throughout this decade. Even the mainstream media has had to cover such transitions both parties must undergo. Acknowledgement of the corruption found on both sides of the political aisle is one of the core concepts which amazing outlets like We Are Change, InfoWars, and the Corbett Report attempt to spread. I have always found the current two-party system completely inadequate for aggregating the will of the people. I have long adored the idea of having either more parties or no parties. On larger issues, both parties give us the same results. On smaller manufactured issues, the polarizing effect of having primarily two extreme camps to choose from is hurting more than helping. The negative effects of such polarization also skyrocket when single ideologies are forced upon all scenarios. Instead of more flexible case by case, instead of a more flexible case by case basis. Fortunately, the freedom movement has loud voices warning people not to follow any one ideology. So this is a humble request for everyone to keep pushing past the confines separating us, to keep finding increasingly targeted solutions to counter-offer those provided from the top-down system. Avoiding the following two paradigms might help the movement hone our arguments and improve our messaging of our analysis uh, of our alternative analysis of deep politics. More government versus less government? No, quality over quantity. The first pitfall I see appeals to many of my good patriot friends who stand firmly behind slogans for, quote, less government. But to my eyes and ears, such statements feel a bit counterproductive to our shared goals. The concept of, quote, less government or, quote, more government for that matter, is vague enough to be co-opted by almost any harmful solution provided. This formula should also not be endlessly applied, as our, libertar- as our libertarian friends sometimes follow this mantra far too blindly. Most importantly, the slogan itself implies the size of government has a causal relationship with its level of corruption or negative impact. Larger organizations of any type may have more room for bad apples to hide and prosper, but they also have potential for greater good as they grow, like the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. So I argue that our society's policies and incentives promoted by our manufactured culture have far greater influence on the positive or negative nature of the impact of organizations, governmental or not. With a smaller government than our current monstrosity in a similar, similarly apathetic political climate, it might be even easier to for a given corporation to influence the government and its policies. At the same time, there's a real threat of, quote, big government when corporations can entrench entire departments. They proactively, they are proactively using government agencies to directly enact their corporate agenda and creatively increase their government contracts and budgets in order to keep growing. We saw this quite publicly during, the, during George W. Bush's years as the military industrial puppet when in that, quote, small government administration, we saw corporate-owned departments strip themselves down as much as possible, completely dissembling any form of meaningful regulation over themselves. A fresh and painful example of this came to light with the documented failures of the Minerals Management Service to provide any meaningful oversight over regula- or, or regulation on British Petroleum's Deepwater Horizon oil rig. But don't worry, the department has been uh, rebranded as the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement, so we should probably assume it's all fixed. 
our, our current predictable, quote, Great Recession also could have been avoided or at least postponed if trillions of dollars in profit incentives had not been allowed to manifest in the first place as derivatives, subprime mortgages, and other legal Ponzi schemes. But if the incentives of our culture were shifted enough and more procedures were made 100% transparent to the public, we might be able to find some governmental G-spot where the government actually reflects the public's interest. This may be theoretical, but it should be nearly attainable, not even requiring a, rev a revolution, but incremental changes in the correct direction. And isn't this what we should be striving for? An ever more pure realization of those constitutional ideals inspiring us to believe in our remarkable republic or democracy? But this process must become, begin with all deliberate speed. The Tea Parties, initially started years ago by Ron, the Ron Paul Revolution, were recently co-opted and largely taken over by the GOP in 2009, at least as far as the mainstream I can see. And I give props to the, to the now very rare Tea Party candidates and their supporters who remain opposed to the GOP and are willing to keep thinking outside of the box and the mainstream, uh, the mainstream box and trying new things, no matter how distasteful some of their select views may be to me. On the other side, Democrats don't seem to be promoting interesting candidates to vote for and are settling in for, a class, for classic fights for the lesser of two evils, despite ever-present disapproval for Congress and their utter failure to progress in the last two years. I need to see more liberal candidates to grow balls as big as those rare Tea Partiers resisting the lame, moderate, useless Democratic Party line, no matter how distasteful select views of theirs might be to me. The causality implied between more government and bad government does not seem theoretically sound. With a truly responsible government, an increase in size could simultaneously increase citizen freedoms. We, look, we must look at the results of our government's efforts and its degree of transparency in order to judge it. We need to focus on uprooting the incentives for corruption in government, perhaps starting with campaign finance reform and revolving door protections, instead of just saying we want to change its size. A wise woman once told me, it's not really the size of your government that matters, it's all about how you use it. The capitalism versus socialism paradigm. This paradigm is even more polarizing, and I consider it another ridiculous pitfall. Capitalism and socialism often represent the only two options offered to align with, but we don't even consider trying to come up with any new forms of national economic or governmental organization. Case by case, those rooting for capitalism might tend to dismiss, dismiss socialist solutions, and vice versa, staying loyal to their dominant ideology. But as humans, we sometimes get trapped into acting like these ideologies are some mythical unified theory. How many, quote, socialized or, quote, nationalized services and industries does the public generally approve of? I think of, quote, free government services like the highway system, federal waterways, national park service, federal bureau of investigations, census bureau, social security, small business administrations, and, of course, the military and the services for veterans. And how many capitalist, quote, capitalist services does the public generally approve of? Are we the people currently healthy and happy with the choices provided for necess necessities like our food, housing, health care, and energy? From the start, our country and most, quote, developed countries have used a collection of, quote, capitalist and, quote, socialist tools. For an additional challenge, try to factor in the constant increase of private contractors used by nationalized services, like with Blackwater and Halliburton. A September ProPublica headline highlights a classic example of this, quote, this year contractor deaths exceed military ones in Iraq and Afghanistan. Even better, uh, the number of recent cases we've seen where the profits are privatized while the risks are socialized, such as the painful bank bailouts and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I also think the nature of who and where the finances come from to run our government should be a critically important factor in what people think is worth paying for.
Just 100 years ago, typical American citizens did not pay any income tax. Now Fortune 500 companies just moved to the Cayman Islands. And in August of 2008, CNN reported, quote, The Government Accountability Office, GAO, examined samples of corporate tax returns filed between 1998 and 2005. In that time period, an annual average of 1.3 million U.S. companies and 39,000 foreign companies doing business in the United States paid no income taxes despite having a combined $2.5 trillion in revenue. The study showed that 28% of foreign companies and 25% of U.S. corporations with more than $250 million in assets or $50 million in sales paid no federal income taxes in 2005. Those companies totaled a combined $372 billion in sales for the largest foreign companies and $1.1 trillion in revenue for the biggest U.S. companies. End quote. I strongly oppose any Bush-style income tax cuts which worsen our wealth disparities. But I do like the idea of taxes being collected from corporations where profits are created from business models instead of collecting from laborers' wages. There are also many who argue that our income tax of the last hundred years is even unconstitutional, and I think this is a topic worth considering. For more info on this, you may want to start your research by watching Aaron Russo's 2006 film, America, Freedom to Fascism. The point of terms like crony capitalism or predatory capitalism is to point out just how far we are from the pure idealized form of capitalism touted by talking heads or even Adam Smith. It, it seems the massive mutant capitalist corporations have become so efficient at, the business, at their business that they went ahead and uh, took over our government for us, saving us the trouble of regulating all those companies. But if we reign the corp corporate industrial complex soon, and we force our government to start buying solar panels instead of bombs, we will encourage growth and development of less destructive markets. 